in just a couple of moments, my brothers and sisters, I want to talk about um, what to do when you lose your cutting edge. What to do when you lose your cutting edge. As we <coughs> before we dive into the text, I want to take a moment and just share a little bit about uh, Bible preaching and teaching methodology. Uh, I've shared this before, but I like to, uh, to come back to it every once in a while. Um, there are three ways that uh, we answer the question, what is the Bible saying? When we ask that, we're not asking what the words are on the page, but we're asking, what is the Bible saying to me? What is the truth that is, comes out of this passage that is for my life. And so there, there are three basic ways that people approach that um, when it comes to reading the Bible. Uh, the first is to ask the question, what is the author trying to communicate to the audience that the author is writing to? Um, and, and so um, in, uh, in, in theology uh, terminology, we call those people A people, uh, A for author. They're the way they understand what the Bible is saying to them is they say, what is the author trying to communicate to the original audience? And that is what God is saying to us. Um, God spoke through the author to the people the author was talking to, and so we have to figure that out in order to find out what God is saying to us. And so you'll hear sometimes preachers or people who are teaching, when they look at the Bible and they are trying to explain it, they will take uh, a, a deep amount of time to look at who is writing the passage and they'll say, well, this book is 1 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians was written by Paul and uh, we know this about Paul that he once was Saul from Tarsus, he once was a persecutor of Christians, he was uh, going to attack, he had this conversion experience and it changed his life. He was somebody who always uh, was excited about the things of God but didn't know what he was going and so now he's had this change and he understands that Jesus, and so as he's writing to this church that he's planted in first, and all of that is author conversation. And what they're doing is not trying to impress you by how much they know about it. What they're saying is that if you really want to know what First Corinthians is talking about, what it's saying to you, you have to understand what Paul was trying to say to the church. And so they'll give you all the background to explain that. And it might even go as far as to say, well, this word is pray in the English, but in the Greek it's cross euphemia, which means that you are bowing down and uh, actually casting something forward. And so uh, uh, those conversations are a way of helping you to understand what the author was trying to say to the people that the author was writing to. We call those A people, uh, or author. There's a second way of trying to understand it. We call them T people. T stands for text. Uh, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a T person. If you hear me preach, I'm, I'm a big T person. I'm not, I'm not the T party, I'm a T person. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the T people, the text people, are people who look at uh, the, the, what, is, what is the story that is being unfolded here? How does this story fit into the larger narrative that's happening in this book? Um, what, is, what are we seeing on the page? Who are the characters that are involved in the text? I might not be as concerned about who writes, so when I preach uh, through Mark, I'm not uh, that interested in who Mark is or what Mark was trying to do. What I'm interested in is what is Mark seeing and saying? Who's in the text? Who are the characters in the text? And those of you who remember when we were doing Bible study, you remember these questions. Who's in the text? Who are the people? Uh, where are the people situated in their life? Who has power and who doesn't have power? Those are all text questions uh, uh, because it, it's saying that if you really want to know what God is saying, the truth, you have to understand what's happening on the text and how the text is connected to other things in the text. And then there's a third one, it's an R, uh, and R is a reader, um, and, and what it's saying is that uh, sometimes the truth of what God is saying uh, isn't in what the author is saying, and, and, and it's not even necessarily in what the text is saying in and of itself, um, but it is in what I am bringing to the text that intersects with the text. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, so you'll hear that, uh, here, here's the thing, right? This is a secret we don't like to tell, and some people don't even want to acknowledge it, is that we all have something we bring to the life. We are not tabula rosa, we are not blank slates. We are not uh, clear pages that just come to the Bible to get put in to, we actually bring something into the text that affects the way we read it. The question is how clear are we, how well do we understand what we're bringing to the text, right? So if you know me, you know I bring a social economic criticism to every text. When I look at it, I'm looking at who has the power, what are the power structures, what's the economy about. When I look at this text and I see that this man had to borrow an ax to cut down trees, I think about what situation would he have been in if he did not have the ability to go out to somebody and get the tools that he needed to complete the job. That's an important thing that we have. So I, that's the lens I bring to it. Now, what happens is that sometimes we don't know that we are bringing a lens to the text, or we don't want to admit that we're bringing a lens to the text, because some preachers and some pastors uh, uh, feel less confident about saying, this is what I see in the text. And so what they want to say is, this is what God wants you to see in the text. Yeah. Because they, if, if I tell you what God wants you to see, you can't argue with God. If I tell you what I want you to see, you might not see what I want you to see. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that's when, uh, that's when we get into a little bit of danger, when we don't allow people to read the text and to hear and say, do I see in the text what you see in the text, right? It's one of the reasons why we have conversations afterwards, because I don't ever want you to think I have the final word on the text. Uh, but God actually wants, he has something for you to think about and wrestle with. So we have A people, T people, and R people. Uh, now the truth is, in almost every sermon, you'll hear some of all three. You'll always hear an R. Some people won't tell it, but there's always an R. And then you'll hear people who normally are either a big A and a little T or a big T and a little A. And so now the next time you're in, uh, you're listening to a sermon, and the sermon, and your eyes are starting to glaze over because the sermon isn't as interesting as you would like for it to be. This is a game you can play with. I do this all the time with, with, with sermons. Is I say, okay, let me, is this person an A, a T, or an R? And so then I listen and I figure out, okay, so that statement is an A statement. This is all about the author. And then it helps me to keep engaged in the sermon uh, because I'm playing a game with what they're saying. So that, that's a, it's, it's a technique. You can even try it in this sermon right now. Uh, with A, T, or R. But I'm going to tell you, this is an R sermon. Because this is, I don't know what the author was trying to do with this uh, snippet. That seems out of place in a larger story. And I'm going to do a little bit of examining of the text, but not to see what the text says, but because I want to read this as a metaphor. Now, I want you to understand that the author of 2 Kings might not have intended anything that I'm saying to be interpreted from this. I can't promise that he did. But this is how I see it. This is the metaphor I read into it, and I'm hoping that the metaphor I read into it might be helpful for you. Is that all right? Um, uh, what to do when you lose your cutting edge? Uh, so this is the first place of, of the metaphor. A metaphor is, uh, is a comparison. Uh, uh, for those of you who uh, are English nerds like I am, you know that a metaphor is a comparison that does not use like or as, because if you use like or as, then it becomes a simile. Um, uh, and it's that something stands for something else. We're talking about an axe, but we're really not talking about an axe. He loses an axe in the water, but it actually stands in the way, it stands for something else. And so what I want to say is that, in, in this metaphor, that the axe uh, stands for this, this notion that I'm talking about, this idea of having a cutting edge. We don't talk about, we don't use that phrase as much anymore. It used to be a phrase talking about it. How do you keep your cutting edge? How do you keep, uh, uh, as Pastor Sheer wants to talk about, your competitive advantage? How do you keep that thing that keeps you sharp, that passion, that intensity, that focus? Um, how do you 
you hold on to that? And what do you do when you lose that? Now, I already admitted to you all at the beginning of this service that I'm human. And, and part of being human means that every once in a while, uh, I lose that passion, that focus. Uh, now, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm be real honest in this. This is going to be a very confessional sermon. Um, I have developed an ability to operate as if everything's okay. Even while internally I feel like everything is collapsing. I developed the ability to go and smile when inside I, I feel like crying. Or I feel like yelling and screaming. Or sometimes I just feel like sitting in the corner and doing nothing. People will ask me, Pastor, how are you doing? And I'll say, I'm okay. I'm doing well. And really what I want to say is, if you knew the totality of the things that are bothering me right now, not only would you not ask the question, you would run in the opposite direction. <laughs> now, there's some good in that. There's some blessing in that. There's a blessing in the ability to be able to maintain and go forward even in difficult times. The danger in that, though, is that if you never address the thing that is problematic, the man is sitting there, he's cutting trees, he has an axe. He loses the axe head into the water. Uh, I, I, I spoke about this earlier. The first point of this message uh, isn't a surprise. Uh, I telegraphed it uh, before that you have to admit what is wrong. You have to be able to talk about and deal with the issue. Think about how silly it would have been for this man while everybody else around him is cutting trees. If he were to continue to act like he is cutting trees even while his axe head was in the water. Yeah. How silly would he have looked with just a wooden stick hitting a tree with a wooden stick acting like he was cutting something down. Not only would he have looked silly, he would have been wasting his time in the time of his compatriots. Not doing what needed to be done because the axe head, the part that was actually doing the cutting, was in the water. Now, here's the other part of the metaphor. I told you that the axe represents that cutting edge, that passion, that focus that you have. The water, my brothers and sisters, as water does throughout the biblical text, represents chaos. The reason that Egypt, uh, that Pharaoh and the Egyptian army uh, think that they have won the day when they get uh, Moses and the children of Israel to the Red Sea after the Exodus is because they knew that uh, the water represented chaos and the Egyptian gods had one job. Their job was to keep chaos uh, working for the king, to keep the king in power. And so the chaos would disrupt everything else in order to keep power to the king. And what God does is God holds back the chaos to let the people go across. And then when Pharaoh and his army enter into the water, God causes the chaos to collapse. On them. Water represents chaos. When Jesus and the disciples get into the boat and they go across the water, every time they go from the east side to the west side of the river, every time they go from the side that they're comfortable with to the side where uh, the other people live, every time they make that journey, there's chaos in the water. A storm arises. Winds are blowing. The disciples think they're going to drown. Jesus, wake up. Why are you asleep? Don't you know? It's chaos. When Jesus steps out and he says, peace, be still. 
is not just speaking to the winds and the waves, he's speaking to the chaos. Water represents chaos, my brothers and sisters. And so I want to argue in this text that when this man is, loses his axe head into the water, it's, it is a metaphor for losing that passion, that drive, losing that focus into the chaos of our lives. Now, maybe I'm the only person in here who's ever lost something in the chaos of life. Maybe I'm the only person in here who the ups and the downs and the ins and the outs and uh, uh, the good days and the bad days have taken a toll on you and you feel like you're not the same person you once were. You wake up in the morning sometimes and you look at yourself in the mirror and you see yourself, but you don't really recognize the self that you see because it seems like something is wrong because all the chaos around you seems to have taken something out of you. Maybe I'm the only person in here who's been like that before, my brothers and sisters, but I want to stand up and say that I know what it's like to lose the axe head of my life into the chaos of the stuff around me, and I've got to look to the Bible and ask the question, what do I do when I lose my cutting edge? First thing, my brothers and sisters, that uh, the text uh, I argue points out is that we've got to admit that we've lost something. We can't continue on as if things have not changed. Somebody said the definition of insanity is doing the same things, expecting a different result. Um, my brothers and sisters, when we um, When that time comes and we have lost the cutting edge, we have to be willing to acknowledge and say that we've lost something, that things are different, things aren't the same. I have to change up something about what's happening right now. The man had to stop trying to cut in order to deal with the fact that the axe head was in the water. The job that he was supposed to be doing, he had to stop for a second to figure out how to get the axe head back. He couldn't keep doing what he was doing if he was going to be successful in doing anything at all. He had to stop, my brothers and sisters. Now, the second thing I see in this text, now I want to be clear about this. I'm not writing a prescription for you on this, right? I'm just telling you what I see in this text. And you can talk about how this impacts or doesn't impact you in a minute. But this is what I see in this text. What this man does is, after he acknowledges that uh, the axe head is, is, is gone, um, after he realizes it, he stops cutting, the next thing he does, or it's actually something he doesn't do, is he does not leave the group of people cutting trees down. And it would be tempting for him to just leave and go home. He's lost the axe head. They came out to do a job, which is to cut down trees, because the place they were living was too small. And so it makes sense. I'm out here. I'm supposed to be doing this job. I'm supposed to be cutting trees. I can no longer cut trees, so maybe I should just go home. Maybe I should just go do something else. Because I no longer seem to be useful doing what I came out to do. So maybe it's time for me to just leave. But, my brothers and sisters, what I want to point out is that if he had left, he never would have got the X back. If he had walked away, he never would have regained his cutting edge. Which is even more important in this text because what he had wasn't his. The axe really belonged to somebody else. Now, if I had time and it wasn't so cold and I could preach this the way I wanted to preach this, I would tell you that your cutting edge, that thing, that passion, that uh, that spark that's inside of you was never yours. To you think that just because you've lost it for a moment means that you can walk away and nothing will be different, uh, my brothers and sisters, means that you aren't understanding that it wasn't your axe in the first place. 
place. God gave it to you. You were just a steward of that ass. Uh, don't you remember the story of uh, uh, the three servants uh, who had, uh, they had a master, and the master gave the three stewards uh, talents, uh, 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 money to invest while the master was away, and uh, they go and they uh, do different things with it, and the master comes back and he says, give me an account of what you've done, and the first person says, uh, uh, master, you gave me $5,000, and I took that $5,000, and I turned it into $10,000, so here's the $5,000 that you gave me, and here's the $5,000 that I made on top of it, and he said, you've been faithful over this $5,000, come on, I'm going to give you more to deal with. And then the other, he goes to the next person and he says, uh, Master, you gave me $2,000. And I took the $2,000 you gave me and I turned that $2,000 into $4,000. Uh, so here's the $2,000 you gave me and here's the $2,000 uh, that I made on top of it. He said, you've been faithful over a few things, so come on and let me give you some more to deal with. And then the next person came back and he said, well, Master, I knew you had a tough reputation. Everybody talks about how mean you are and how difficult you can be. So I was scared I didn't want to lose your money. And so I took the $1,000 that you gave me and I went and I hid it in the ground. And now I've gotten it back. So here's the $1,000 that you gave me so I didn't lose anything so we're square. And he said, you wicked and lazy, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you knew that my business was about taking what I had given you and making more out of it. And I would have rather you risked it and lost it than just to sit on it and do nothing. But since you want to be, uh, since you want to sit and do nothing, I'm going to take that from you and give it to the person who knows how to handle it, and you get out. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to say is that that edge that you had was never yours to begin with. I, I know you think you worked for that intelligence. If you put iron in water, it's going to sink. 
Because the iron is dense. The water has less density. And so when you put something that is dense in a solution that has less density, it sinks. It does not float. The only way it floats is if it has less density. It's why you can put iron in mercury and liquid mercury and it will float. Because liquid mercury is dense. I only know that because one of my friends used to joke. He used to say, you're about as dense as liquid mercury is his favorite joke. <laughs> that's how I learned. Iron does not float. Uh, this was before people had scuba equipment. So there was no search or retrieval team coming to find the axe. So the probability of the outcome of this story is the axe is lost permanently. It looks like it's never coming back. So that the man would ask for help with a problem that seemed to have no solution seems a little bit crazy. the bank. 
rapper who uh, was in another land in another country was uh, had this dreadful disease. Heard a servant girl say, "If Naaman was in the house in the land where I live and could speak to the prophet, the prophet could heal him of his leprosy." And so that Naaman leaves his home and goes to the prophet's house and says, "I need a blessing." And the prophet sends Naaman to the Jordan River to dip seven. we've lost. 